uncertainty principle. The principle that if the precision of one of your measurements goes up, the other must unfortunately go down. Now, how does that work? How do we formalize it? Well, just as a beginner, or as an appetizer, let's offer you the analogy that I gave when I informally introduced this a long time ago. Let's say you're making pulses with a rope in your backyard. One day you make one very large pulse, and a man walks up to you and asks, what's the position? And you can answer that very well because you just take the midpoint of the pulse and you report to him, well, it's 3.5 meters away or something. Then he asks you, well, what's the wavelength? And that makes no sense to you because it's not a periodic pulse. It's just one. And one thing that's not periodic can't have a wavelength or anything close to it, right? So you tell him, well, I don't know. I can't measure that very well. And then, the next day, you make a lot of pulses, kind of like a sinusoidal wave. Then, he walks up to you and asks, what's the position? And that makes no sense suddenly, because, I mean, it's a wave. It's periodic. Every single place is as good as the other, where every single crest is just as good as every single trough for answering this question. So, what do I tell him? But then, he asks you, what's the wavelength? And that's very easy to answer, because now it's periodic. So there's a very well-defined concept of wavelength. So the precision in position can go up, but the precision in wavelength has to go down and vice versa. That is the essence of the uncertainty principle. But how do we formalize that? Well, let me bring out the table that I gave in my informal introduction. And if you have a very high precision measurement of one, that means that your margin of error is not very high. Everything, every single result you have is almost the exact same as one another. So a scatter plot of results might look something like this. Meanwhile, if you're high precision on one, the uncertainty principle tells you that you're going to be low precision on the other. So you're still going to get high accuracy, you're going to get the same number of decimal places, but the actual measurements are going to be unreliable, fleeting, and constantly changing. So, the scatter plot might look something like this. Now, what's the difference between these two scatter plots? Well, both of them have a well-defined mean. This one's mean is maybe right over here, and this one's mean is, let's say, over here. Now, let's check out how big of a circle we need centered at the mean line in order to encase every single one of our results, or just like 90% of them, or 80% of them. Look at the distance between this and this, between this and this, between this and that, between this and this, between this and this, this and this, this and this, this and this. The distance between everything and the mean is huge. But wait, don't we have a measurement for that? Well, yeah, we do. It's called variance. The variance of this distribution is high. But, that's the price we pay for the variance of the position distribution to be low, which is good. So, it looks like if the variance of our position measurements goes up, then the variance 
of our momentum measurements will go down, and vice versa. And indeed, this is the crux of the law. The law tells us the product of these two variances is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So, when the variance is greater than h bar over 2, then that means that your tools are just not that great. But, if these two are exactly equal to h bar over 2, that means you've hit the limit of measurement precision. You can no longer improve one without not uh, without degrading the other. That is the point of the uncertainty principle. But, I mean, we have to get into the mathematical formalism, right? So, let's drop this and get to the chalkboard. So, how is this going to work? Well, first of all, what's the formula for standard deviation? Well, it's the mean value of the mean distance, sorry, the standard deviation is the square of the mean distance of some random point and the mean. So it measures the distance squared on average between some data point and the central data point. Central would technically be medium. So it's the expected value of this squared. I should probably. There it is. That's the standard deviation. Pretty simple, right? But now, how do we translate that into quantum mechanics? Well, let's say that we happen to have two properties. In this case, position and momentum. One of them is going to have a standard deviation defined by, well, the expected value squared, what's that going to be? It's going to be the inner product of what's inside this with itself. That's how squares work when you're work dealing with vectors. So what's going to be inside here? Well, you're going to have the expected value of the operator, in this case the position operator, and I think we already talked about how to define expected values of operators last time, minus um, x, which is just, you know, the operator by itself, psi, and this is just going to be itself again. So here it is. There it is. And same thing with momentum. Now, I'm going to, because these are so clunky to write, define this as f and this as g. So, at the end of the day, we're now dealing with f inner product with itself g inner product with itself. Now, by the cauchy schwarz inequality, you should know that f dot g is less than or equal to the norm of both of these guys squared, which comes from the dot product being this multiplied by cosine theta, which is always less than or equal to 1. So, that applies for the functional inner product, too. The product of the inner product of f with itself, multiplied by the inner product of g with itself, is going to be greater than or equal to the inner product of f and g squared. Notice that I squared it, 
because this is actually acting like the norm of f squared. This is the norm of g squared, so on. So there it is. Actually, this should be. No, I think. I... Yeah, yeah. I added an extra factor by mistake. This should be no. Is it square? No. I'll just keep it the way it is. So we now know that the variance of x squared multiplied by the vari variance of momentum squared is going to be greater than or equal to the variance of f's inner product with g squared. Taking the modulus, because this could be a complex number. Now, realize that The modulus of a complex number, including the inner product of f and g, is equal to its real part squared plus its imaginary part squared. Both of these are real numbers. And obviously that's just greater than or equal to the imaginary part Squared. And well, what's this? The imaginary part is equal to a number minus its conjugate divided by 2i. And in this case, the inner product of f and g by the inner product axioms, the conjugate of an inner product has to be the reversed inner product, product of g and f over 2i squared. And now here's the nice part. Because of the way, uh, sorry, because of the way f is shaped, its inner product with g is going to be equal to the x operator multiplied by p minus the p operator multiplied by, no, sorry, that's the commutator, oops, minus position times momentum. And the way, if we just reflect these, you get position multiplied by, actually no, I think this should be this way and this should be that way, sorry. Operators don't commute with each other, but scalars like these guys do. Well, this is actually a vector, but this is scalar. Wait, no, uh, momentum is a vector, but vectors commute with each other, operators don't. Okay, good. So, you get this. And when you subtract A from B, you get the commutator of x and p, xp minus px. How do you even deal with this? Well, here's the nice thing. p, the operator, has a very quick definition. And so, when we plug it in here, what does it do to a test function? Well, let's take x hat, p hat, minus p hat, x hat, and apply it to a poor, unassuming function right here. So what's going to happen to this unfortunate function? Well, the first half is going to multiply it by position inside. It's going to have h bar over i d dx f. And what's going to happen to the second part? Well, it's going to be h bar over i d dx of xf. And so you can factor out h bar over i and get x d dx f minus d dx xf, which becomes f plus, this time you take x d dx f by the product rule. And so, this cancels out with that, and you get minus h bar f over i, and minus 1 over i is just i. So you get i h bar f, which means this operator, since this is equal to i h bar f, this operator is just a scalar, i h bar. Nice. Which means that this becomes i 
each bar in the end. Which is cool, right? Because when you cancel out the eyes, you're left with the fact that, plugging back in here, the standard deviation of position multiplied by the standard deviation of momentum squared has to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2 squared. The standard deviation has to be positive by definition. This is positive, so we are legally allowed to take off the square without adding a plus minus and get the final statement of Heisenberg's true uncertainty principle. And more generally, you can have it for any two of these operators. This has to be greater than or equal to 1 over 2i multiplied by the commutator of the a and b operators squared. Oh, this is squared. So, that's all for today.